Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming out today. And thank you, Phil, for setting up this talk and everyone else here. Um, I'm, this is my first time in Budapest, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. And what I wanted to uh, just start out with, which has very little to do with my talk, so I'm going to mostly speak about the US context. But um, I am in Toulouse, and it's in southern France. And I'm sure folks heard about the attacks on the Charlie Hebdo a satirical newspaper a few weeks ago where a number of journalists uh, were killed and there was quite a reaction in France and around the world. Um, and on social media, the main hashtag, there certainly wasn't just one, people created their own, was Je suis Charlie. Um, and this, uh, there were a number of protests and events and I just took a picture of this one that, that warmed my heart. So a very, a, a very important national phrase in France is liberty, fraternity, and, e and egalité, right? Equality. Um, but in Toulouse, where I live, cassoulet is like the regional dish. So liberty, fraternity, and cassoulet. All right. So what is democracy and what is digital activism? So that's really what I'm going to talk about today, as I said, in a US context. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term digital activism, there are a number of terms thrown out there. I'm just going to use that mostly today. Um, after the Charlie Hebdo uh, attacks, I was interviewed by um, the BBC, and she used a term that I really liked that I had never heard before. Um, rather than calling the Je suis Charlie hashtag uh, activism, she used the term hashtag solidarity, um, which I thought was a very interesting way to begin to find a little bit of nuance in this idea of digital activism, right? Phil mentioned that initially there was a lot of euphoria. And that's one of my tasks today is to kind of unpack that euphoria and really look at what's going on in the case that I'll be talking about. So I will be arguing, um, as Phil mentioned, the, the issue of social class inequality with digital activism as well as getting at this broader idea of democracy. And there's so many ways we can define democracy. I'm sure many of you have spent a lot of time talking about what in the heck that is, as well as what in the heck digital democracy is. Today, I'm going to focus on uh, a definition that a lot of political scientists and some sociologists use around this idea of participation and what that actually means, having uh, egalitarian participation. And so I'm going to argue that not only does social class kind of question this idea of participation, but also another idea around uh, hierarchy uh, or non-hierarchy that is the argument in a lot of uh, digital activism discussions. And also just kind of briefly touch on this idea of political ideology and how that might map on to democracy. But first, let's look at a little bit of what puzzle we might have with uh, where the literature is. Uh, and as Phil mentioned, I'm a sociologist, so that's where my frame, uh, my framing of a lot of these ideas come from. So if we look at the social movement literature within sociology, primarily, there have been two ways in which theorists have argued that social movements cannot be very democratic around this idea of participation. One is uh, by this theorist, Michel, uh, who um, argued over 100 years ago that even the most democratic organizations that start out very democratic and participatory end up being very oligarchic. And the way that he described this, he you know, definitely discussed some of these ideas of hierarchy and bureaucracy, but the idea is that initially you may have a lot of people making decisions, but eventually it's just a few people, um, and that there are layers of, of bureaucracy and, and hierarchy. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by those terms in a little bit. Um, but the other area, so you have one group of scholars saying there's all this oligarchy in social movements, and then another group of scholars has said there's quite a bit of social class inequality in social movements around access to resources, in terms of accessing sources of power, and impacting social change. There's a lot of social class inequality. 
However, with the internet, there have been challenges to these claims, at least implicit challenges. One is that a number of scholars have argued that social movements in the digital era are much less hierarchical because of the architecture of digital technology. They're less bureaucratic, and organizations themselves are less relevant. And there's also this uh, general idea that social movements are therefore more egalitarian, more people can participate in them, and there are a couple ways that uh, scholars have argued what the mechanisms are for that, like why, why is that? What are these so-called affordances is a term that communication scholars use a lot. So one is this idea that with the internet, rather than having organizations, that we now have this idea of networked individualism, and it's important to think of, rather than members of organizations, that we have individual users within social movements. Another argument uh, for this idea of more egalitarian participation and the need for less organization is that we have lowered or no cost to participate. Um, where, and, and this kind of gets at this theory, general theories of collective action by Olson, who uh, made a number of arguments around uh, the, the cost that, that people have to undertake, right? Um, and we can talk a little bit more about his theory of the free rider dilemma later, but I, what I wanted to drive home right now is this idea of the cost to participate, right? So if you wanna participate in a social movement um, before the digital era, you would have had to physically go to a meeting, um, take more time, um, maybe face um, some other costs in your lives. And what some scholars argue that, that in very online intense organizing at least, that those costs to participation are either completely reduced or drastically lowered. There are other scholars who offer um, a little more nuance and say that, well, we really have different kinds of organizations in the digital era, right? There are fewer brick and mortar groups. That means, you know, we don't need physical office spaces um, as much, less face-to-face -face organizing. There's this, there's more personalization, right? And that kind of ties with this idea of individualism and networked individualism. And that um, Chadwick argued we have more these digital hybrid organizations. But I think Costell's, in many ways, kind of sums up um, the general argument that people have made. He said the more interactive and self-configurable, that self-configurable communication is the less hierarchical is the organization and the more participatory is the movement, right? That term participatory is really important. This is why the network social movements of the digital age represent a new species of social movement. Right, so we have this new body of scholarship that says, wait a minute, things are a little bit different in the digital era. So this creates somewhat of a puzzle, right? So on the one hand, we, we have this idea in the past of class inequality and this idea of oligarchy, but then the internet comes along and there are more theories around egalitarianism and flattening. And I'm presenting this puzzle as very kind of either or binary. And, and, and there are certainly nuances. In fact, uh, you know, no scholars come out and said social class doesn't matter anymore with the internet. But there have been these general claims of inequality and no one um, has really looked at it. So, so the idea is that we have more online participation, right, which generally increases participation and therefore more democracy, if that's one of the ways that we can define democracy. Right, but if you look at most of the research, what we know a lot about, um, based on research designs of studies, is how the internet shapes social movements. We know a lot less about the reverse. So if we switch the independent and dependent variable, we know a lot less about how different types of social movements shape how they use the internet. And a lot of these studies have really focused on, um, if we look at most of, of this research, and again, I'm saying most of the research, there are pl plenty of ex exceptions, most studies have looked at politically left uh, social movements. Um, 
<coughs> there have been a lot of studies of using online data and what we all like to call big data now. Um, I'm a personal fan of, of doing a lot of um, online data analysis. It's super fun. Uh, when I first, I took a class at the Kennedy School on network analysis way back, this is so long ago, 2006. I don't know if you even remember being born in 2006. <laughs> you know? So that was so long ago, and, and, and doing social network analysis was painful. You had to kind of import data in this very clunky way from Excel using this program called Usenet, and um, the old version of Usenet, and it just took forever. And, and right now, we all know that, or many of us who might use um, uh, social <coughs> media data, it takes a minute. We can all download any hashtag you can think of in a minute and create a rough, social network diagram in one minute, right? Um, but there's been a lot more emphasis as data collection has become easier and easier to do online. There have been, there's been a lot more research done using online data analysis. We've also looked at a lot more movements that have been very visible, right? Look, groups that are online a lot, whether it's Occupy Wall Street, um, the Arab Spring, and or even before social media, uh, the WTO resistance in Seattle was another movement that really, parts of the movement really uh, embraced the internet. So these very visible movements have been studied. And the movements that we study with the, for digital activism purposes tend to be very kind of event-based um, research. And there's been a lot of great research as well on international movements and national struggles and very, little on uh, local um, movements. And, and all this really made sense because the, you know, digital technology was just kind of coming onto the landscape and it made sense to kind of study these movements that we could very visibly see were using social media. The problem is, I argue, that this is really just the tip of the iceberg. If you really think about how does, politi how, how does politics happen on an everyday basis all over the world, right? Not just these flashpoints of digital activism. And the problem is we've been really selecting on the dependent variable. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we're just selecting on these high levels of cases and then saying the internet might have these effects, but if we're, o if we're only self-selecting and cherry picking um, certain uh, movements, we may not be getting a fuller picture of what's happening. So to address some of these um, limitations, I'm taking just a teeny tiny slice of this iceberg, and I take a field level approach. So I'm looking at one political issue in one state in the United States. And the political issue is collective bargaining rights for public employees. So that's a very kind of cumbersome word to say that there are some states in the US that don't allow public employees, sanitation workers, teachers, firefighters, to have a union contract. In fact, it's outlawed. And so in this state, in North Carolina, people have been organizing around this issue on both the left and the right. So the nice thing about um, this case is I had to go outside of the San Francisco, Berkeley area where there weren't enough conservative groups <laughs> and um, was able to find this issue where you had some very right-wing Tea Party and other groups, as well as more moderate, as well as uh, more far-left groups and more moderate-left groups. And this also gave me a lot of social class variation and different types of organizations, newer, older groups, groups with different um, levels of hierarchy and bureaucracy. So I'm happy to later kind of go into more depth how I operationalized these terms that uh, I just talked about in terms of the, the theories around them. But uh, in my study, I looked at hierarchy um, as three or more levels of decision making within a group. Um, bureaucracy is based on the number of staff people that an organization has. Uh, class is based on working class, mixed class, and middle to upper class groups. And ideology, I define both as left, right, so both kind of just for parsimony or simplicity. Left uh, groups supported collective bargaining rights or union rights, and group on the right opposed them. But I also more broadly define ideology um, as groups being very radical 
uh, in their um, approaches to social change versus groups that were more reformist. So the data collection. So I did um, a number of in-depth interviews, uh, ethnographic observations, spent a lot of time in the field, observing, talking to people, as well as uh, creating a data set of Facebook post tweets and website metrics. So this, I, I'm gonna show you a few kind of graphs, charts, um, which I, I always hesitate giving a talk because it's always really hard to see them. And, um, but I thought it would be really helpful to show you how I looked at Facebook posts, uh, tweets, and what groups are doing with their websites, right? Because it's important to think about, even though Twitter seems like a really important um, digital activist tool or even Facebook, we all know that they may disappear eventually, right? So I wanted to study more than just one um, social media platform. And I also wanted to look at not just do groups have these platforms, right? But how are they designing them for participation? And then also, how are people participating in them, right? So we have a, a saying, right? So if you build it, will people come, right? So if you build this platform, are people coming and participating? And also importantly, are you designing it so that people can participate? So I developed this digital activism index and I kind of standardized all the scores for our, all the groups and I'm happy to share kind of the details of this metric to anyone who's interested, but you know, those of you who might use Facebook for kind of political work might know that you can set up a Facebook page, um, you can set up a page, right, where the owner kind of decides if other people can post or not. I mean, there were some social movement groups I, I, I studied where, where the, the activists were like, yeah, we set up our, our Facebook page, but um, unfortunately, anyone can comment. Right, like as if that was a problem. I mean, they they were be able to, they were able to control the post, but they were disappointed that anyone could comment. So even though we think that these are tools that everyone wants everyone to participate in, that was definitely not always the case. Um, and then of course there are Facebook groups where indeed everyone can um, post. So there was an architecture score um, as that example. I also counted, um, you know the number of retweets, favorites, and followers, for example, as a participation score for Twitter. Um, I wanna get to some of the other actual results, but again, if anyone has questions about this, I'm happy to answer them. All right, I should've showed you that earlier. That's, that's kind of a more detailed look. Um, all right, so then what? Okay, so I have this. What did I find? So first, I did find a pretty substantial di digital activism gap. I have been a digital inequality scholar for a while, but even I was surprised at the extent to which um, the class gaps existed. So these are the, um, just to explain this graph, the standard deviation average of the total scores. Um, I also have scores like for each platform, like a Facebook score or a participation score. Um, and these didn't vary that much um, based on platform or kind of the topology of whether it was participation. And that, and that surprised me. I thought the biggest hurdle would be just the groups actually having the platform, but actually levels of participation were also very, very wide. So the working class groups are very consistently way under the mean, so there's more than one standard deviation difference. Um, between working class and middle to upper class. There was a much higher variation among the middle to upper class groups. Um, some groups felt like we have so much power we don't need to use the internet that much. So what were the mechanisms? Why were these happening? So rather than costs being eliminated in the digital era or drastically reduced for participation, I actually found not only were they high, but they really varied from group to group. That costs actually do really matter, and they're 
there's something that we can't just kind of write off as participation costs being really low. So there were organizational costs, groups that had um, the ability to um, fund staff people, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, but also just having te technical resources and skill level, as well as um, individual members not necessarily having um, the ability to participate. So here's a quote from um, an activist. We can't do everything online because a lot of workers don't sit on the computer all day like I do. They're out, they're working at some type of public service work like sanitation or housekeeping. Or if you have a state job, you might have some time on the computer, but you can't live there outside of your email for your job, right? So people might have a computer at work, but they can't necessarily like go online, assuming they have internet at all. Because I talked to a couple of our members this weekend and they're not working, so they don't have a phone and they don't have internet. So it's gonna be a challenge to get up with them over the next couple of weeks because they're disconnected. And that's the struggle. Like you gotta go to the library to get access to the internet. You're not gonna be able to do that from the comfort of your own home. Um, some other workers I talked to uh, had to give their cell phone into like a special locker when they clocked in at work. So, you know, they weren't able to use that as well. And another key thing is this idea of phones. So, th so there's a lot of, of, of arguments made in the United States that, well, people may not have computers or laptops, but they have their phones, and we're doing a lot of organizing on phones. What I found in my study was that a lot of working class folks used, you know, just had the, basically didn't have smartphones, um, had the ability to text, but weren't able to pay for, um, you know, the $60, $70 a month that it is in the U.S. It's a lot less in France, let me tell you. <laughs> um, so the other key issue, though, even if groups had the, the resources, um, what, I, what I was very curious about um, when talking to people was this idea of kind of entitled empowerment to, to use these tools for, the, for activism. I cannot tell you how many people said, I'm not a tech person. That came from, so, because tech people do that kind of things. Tech people um, are on Twitter. Um, and the most surprising was someone who actually had like taken a class on HTML like 10 years ago or something that still felt like he was not a tech person. The other thing that people use this phrase a lot, up there, like that stuff is up there. Social media, Twitter, people would say Twitter, that, that's up there, right? That's so beyond my, um, you know, my comprehension or something that I, I can't quite access, right? So there's also these power differences as well. All right, so we have the digital activism gap. The other critical finding in my study was that rather than organizations becoming less relevant given digital technology, I found that higher levels of digital engagement and participation were associated with much higher levels of hierarchy and bureaucracy, right? So I think this is the last one I'm gonna show you because they're so hard to read. But these are the, um, Average standardized coefficient for each group. So it's groups that are more hierarchical, groups that are advocacy groups rather than membership groups, and groups that have more staff. The staffing finding wasn't, it was statistically significant, but it, you know, the effect size was not as big. Um, so there I go, I should have zoomed in earlier. So what I found, Can you just go back yes, second? yes. So, this should probably be down here, but this is the average of groups that in my oper operationalization were less hierarchical. Um, again, this is standard deviation wise from the mean. This Those is more higher. Coefficients? Pardon? Those are standard deviations or coefficients? Um, standard yes, yes. And so the average standard deviation for that category of the group. Um, Right, so, and, and this was the other surprising finding. I, I didn't expect, I would think that membership groups would have higher levels of online participation. And, and much higher. Yes, yes, so this was a really, again, I came into this kind of with a it's di digital divide lens, and these were really super surprising findings. 
Um, but why? And this is why doing field work and talking to people um, was, was really super helpful. So here's a quote from a group from the staff person from more hierarchical group. So we said, we've tried to do more multimedia stuff, video, pictures, things like that. And a lot of that is because Facebook, their algorithm, if you have a picture, you're more likely to be seen by more people. There's an editorial process that almost all our writing goes through. We have an editor and then a policy director, so it goes through that. And then I'll do kind of the promotion of it. And then I also tend to watch Twitter during the day to see what's going on at the General Assembly. That's the state legislature. See what's going on in politics. Right, so there's this, uh, groups that had very high levels of participation had people who were constantly engaged and being paid or who, uh, uh, another critical finding was, or who had full-time college-educated volunteers. And those groups were the Tea Party groups. The Tea Party groups generally had no staff, but they had very highly educated, retired people who were online quite a bit, which also kind of challenges this whole age question, right? The Tea Parties are just kicking ass. They're just doing so much online. And it's very grassroots. I mean, you definitely have uh, the Koch brothers funded. The Koch brothers is an extremely conservative, very wealthy um, way that a lot of conservative groups get funded. And they, the Tea Party groups interacted with the kind of very well-financed groups, but that's not, the, the spirit of what the Tea Party was doing really came from the grassroots. I went to so many meetings at steakhouses and, you know, local libraries and, you know, people were really into organizing. They were doing a lot of offline organizing, but they were doing a lot of online organizing. So it's the groups that had um, division of labor, had staff, had the capacity and the management to really keep things going. And that's the other thing is, so, the Twitter data um, is generally over the course of a year. Um, the total um, tweets, et cetera, was for the lifetime of the group. For the Facebook data, um, which is actually easier, I would say easier, uh, <laughs> in some ways easier to get in terms of longer term data, was the entire life of the group's Facebook activity. So we're really looking, I, I really wanted to, to look at overall, rather than just these flashpoints, what was happening. So again, here are these mechanisms. You have this vertical division of labor, again, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, groups that had this capacity and had staff or full-time volunteers. So the other finding um, was around ideology. And I'll just touch on this briefly. So what I did um, in France <laughs> is I just went to Google Images and I, I just typed in digital activist and I just wanted to see what, what would come up. There were quite a few academics and like academic charts that came up. Um, but in terms of like actual <laughs> organizing, um, I just grabbed this. And again, this is in France. I have no idea what would, what would come up here in the US because I know the, the black box is a little bit different. Um, so this is from the, the Green Revolution in Iran. This is around Aaron Schwartz. Uh, this is from the Occupy Wall Street movement, right? So you have this idea of, um, or at least the image portrayed, especially in the media as a digital activist, is this radical left uh, concept, right? At least in the US perspective. So what I found though, first of all, that it was reformist groups. Remember I talked about, I looked at groups that were either reformist or radical. So this is a tweet by this guy, Dana Cope, and he's head of a union, but a union that's very reformist, is not kind of rank and file activist, very, you know, really believes that social change is made by working with the existing institutions. So there was this huge movement that broke out in the middle of my research, which was really fun to watch this movement, this Moral Monday movement that I can talk about um, during the Q&A. Uh, very left kind of grassroots movement by a lot of organizations, especially the NAACP around race, uh, a lot of class issues, as well as this collective bargaining issue, and this emerged. But Dana Cope was explaining why his union was not, Scenic was not part of Moral Monday. We think it's unwise to break the law and overburden fo fellow public employees. P we prefer to sit down and talk policy, right? So they're online a lot. They're engaged constantly. 
um, and really believe that the internet is a way to reach politicians and a way to reach journalists, not to reach their masses or their members, so to speak. So the other really surprising finding was that right-wing groups had much higher digital activist scores, including participation levels. And I found that they were really interested in when they kept talking about getting the truth out, that that was really, really important to them. Groups on the left had a lot, you know, kind of more broader agenda, but for the right-wing conservative organizations, it was really important to them that they get their message out. One uh, Patriot group member said that, um, that Paul Revere, who was a kind of revolutionary icon in the US Revolutionary War 230 years ago, he said, Paul Revere had his horse, we have the internet. Right? That, that belief in, in we really need to get the truth out about what's happening. So one uh, Tea Party member said, two years ago I wasn't on Facebook. My sister told me I had to. I used to look at it as girl stuff. I remember this other member saying, you ought to be on Facebook. I said, it's girl stuff. He said, there are men on there. But I said, girly men. <laughs> so I got on Facebook. I didn't take Facebook seriously at first, but it really kind of defines who the Tea Party is. That's our membership role. Right? So there was this really big belief that I mean, the Tea Party definitely did a lot of, again, like I said, a lot of um, offline organizing, but that Facebook was, a, and Twitter, but especially Facebook was a really good way of getting information out, although they're mostly talking to themselves, like groups on the left too as well. So what do we have then? What does this come down to? So again, my main argument is that if we really want to think about what democracy is, right, if we look at this way of defining democracy, or just one way of defining democracy as participation, and if we want to think about it in the digital activist perspective as online participation, that we still have this social class inequality. In fact, that ha social class was the biggest gap of any of the other factors that I studied. That hierarchy still really rules. It's groups that are more hierarchical, that have much higher levels of digital activism. And that ideology matters, but not quite in the way that we think it does. And that it's groups that actually care more about democracy, particip participatory democracy in their groups tend to care less about the internet. And the reason when I asked folks about this was that they felt like the internet was just one of many tools to get people involved, right? Some folks, you have to go to their house. Some people, you phone call, you have meetings, you do this, you that, you text, you do all kinds of ways to get people involved, and the internet is just w one of many ways to do that. And the upshot is that digital democracy is work. <laughs> it takes a lot of work, right? There's a lot of labor involved. So what are the implications then for this? So first, theoretically, um, I found that it was Michel's, not Castell's. Um, if you remember, Michel's was the guy who argued for this iron law of oligarchy. Um, I mean, I didn't study groups over time, but that this, this idea of hierarchy still really matters in relationship to digital technology, um, that rather than lower, the cost, to participa the cost to participation are high. So challenging the, some of the digital activism research, and that we have this continual reproduction of inequality. And again, that digital democracy is labor intensive, a little typo, and that democracy is not always digital. The methodological implications is that we really need to think more broadly and that a field level approach is a one way that we can look at the everyday practices of how most political work actually gets done. And that in many ways, big data can be too small. Of all of the tweets that I studied, um, there are about 20,000 tweets over this year long period. Only one tweet was from a working class group. So statistically zero. So when we're doing big data analysis and we're studying tweets because they're so easy and they're so fun and I love to do them too, to do that too, but it, it's, it has a very strong weakness in relationship to class 
as well as some of the other areas Phil mentioned, potentially around race, ethnicity, and gender. So policy-wise, it's important to think about addressing this question of digital inequality um, for real equity with political voices. And again, that we have to be careful uh, in terms of policy analysts not to just rely on, on big data reports. All right, and I'd like to thank the very hierarchical and bureaucratic organizations that funded my research, but in no way affected the findings. Um, and I look forward to your questions. 